We're starting a new message series today called Shipwrecked, in which we're going to be taking a look at the next several weeks about different, uh, different things that might shipwreck us when it comes to our faith. And the idea from this comes from Scripture itself, from Paul's letter to Timothy. We see in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 to 19, Paul tells Timothy this. He says, Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies that once were made about you. So that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well, holding on to faith and good conscience, which some have rejected, and so suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. Uh, This text is interesting for a couple different reasons. One, Paul's telling Timothy, some have shipwrecked when it comes to their faith. And, and we see that, yeah, can we stumble in our faith? Can our faith be lost? Yes, and Paul's warning Timothy that that would not happen to him. The other thing that's interesting is Paul's telling Timothy, he's writing this in keeping with some prophecies that were made about him. Now, we don't know what those prophecies were. Uh, we don't know exactly what those prophecies said, but probably something that was a warning or an encouragement to Timothy uh, that, that he would be true and faithful uh, as uh, as his ministry went forward, and Paul's bringing this up so that he would not become shipwrecked in the faith. Now, I use a phrase fairly often, and that phrase is, life is messy. And and I say that to mean that sometimes we do stupid things or, or things that we shouldn't, and we bring all kinds of pain and hurt and you know, suffering and dysfunction into our lives, and we can, by the actions that we take, we can make our lives really messy. But life can also be messy because sometimes we don't do anything to invite it in, and in, uh, n- not due to any actions of our own, uh, life can become terrible and can become messy as well. Life is messy because sometimes something will look really good, promising. It seems like a blessing and we embrace it. And even though we, we thought it would be a blessing, it turns out to not be a real blessing to our lives. And it turns out to be more like a curse. And life is messy because sometimes something looks really bad. It, it looks like something we want to avoid, it, it, something that could be very negative. We avoid it and it turns out that if we had embraced it, it would have been a blessing. In many ways, life, life can be messy. You know, we saw that in a very public way uh, a little over a week ago. A week ago this past Saturday, for those of you who are a little older and you remember the, uh, the TV series Friends, everyone was shocked to hear that Matthew Perry uh, had died. He was just 54 years old. He, uh, he, he was found dead in his hot tub. And, uh, and, and it came out that, you know, Matthew Perry's one that his whole life had been dealing with a real messy life and, 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 and different shipwrecks all his own. And it turns out that he had a drug addiction and, and an alcohol addiction. And, um, and all he ever wanted to do was become a, be an actor and, and, and hit it big. And, and he hit it big and yet still that wasn't enough. Uh, he, he didn't find uh, peace in that. He didn't find contentment in it. And, and, and he kept having to turn to drugs and alcohol to somehow make it better. Well, how did he die or, or what caused him to die? They still don't know. The, the initial results were inconclusive. They're doing toxicology reports. Uh, I had heard that he had actually been sober for the last year or so. Some have even said that he had kind of found God and had come to faith. Uh, so maybe he became ship, shipwrecked in his faith, but certainly across the decades that he was struggling with this abuse, the, the messiness of life caused him to at least be shipwrecked in a lot of pain and suffering in life. Now, over the next several weeks, we're going to be taking a look at several different angles of, of how we can become shipwrecked in our faith. Today's going to be the broadest. Uh, we're going to look at it from, from a really wide, uh, wide angle. And uh, today, what I want to talk to you about is how life's circumstances can cause uh, life to, to, to become messy and for us to become shipwrecked in our faith. And I'm going to talk about several different things. And some of these things maybe you haven't experienced in your life, but I, I think every one of us in here, as I go through this, you will have known certain people who've experienced some of these different things. Um, 
But before we get into that, let's start where I normally like to start, and that is I want to take a look at an example from Scripture of, of someone in the Bible that became shipwrecked in their faith. And most of you know this person and know this story. Uh, if you grew up in, in, in church, if you went to Sunday school as a kid, chances are you heard the story of a, a height-impaired individual whose name was Zacchaeus. And you learn the song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Well, who's this Zacchaeus guy? Well, Zacchaeus is, was this Jew uh, that, that was seen as a, a sinner, was seen as someone who had uh, been shipwrecked in his faith uh, because ultimately he was a tax collector. And as a tax collector, a chief tax collector, he would collect money from the Jews and he would give it to the, the, the Romans. And sometimes he would collect more than what was due. And the difference, he just kind of kept himself and he became very wealthy as a result of it. Let's take a look at a story from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. Now Jesus entered Jericho, and he was passing through. And a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. And he wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran ahead, and he climbed up a sycamore fig tree in order to see Jesus, since Jesus was coming his way. Now, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately, for I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and they began to mutter to each other, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give you half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So what's interesting about the, the story is Zacchaeus, he had become shipwrecked. He, he, he was not seen as a, as a devout Jew, but Jesus goes and he meets him where he's at. When, when, when he encounters Jesus, he's still in his, his, his sin. He's still in this, this, doing a bunch of things that were ultimately shipwrecking him in his faith and separating him from God. But Jesus meets him where he's at and he simply calls out to him. And he says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house today. And it's just in that encounter with Jesus that all of a sudden, like Zacchaeus just makes this proclamation. He's an extremely wealthy person. He says, you know what? Half of all that I have, half of my wealth, I'm going to give to the, to, to the poor. And if I've stolen, he has this reputation of someone who, you know, has like fraudulently overcharged people and so forth. He says, if I've stolen from anyone, I'll give four times that which I've stolen. And, and, and Jesus says, now salvation has come. Because the, the, the son of Abraham who had become shipwrecked in their faith has now been restored. And so... I'm about to go through this series of different things that can cause us, like Zacchaeus, to become shipwrecked in our faith. So I want to talk about those things, but I also want to talk about how we become unshipwrecked in our faith. Because in the same way that Jesus was able to, to, to get Zacchaeus restored and, and ship, you know, figuratively speaking, sailing again, so too when we become shipwrecked, we can look to Jesus to do the same for us. So once again, I'm going to go through a series of different topics this morning, and as I do, not all of these are going to apply to you, but I think we'll know someone in our lives who they do apply to. And the first thing, and probably maybe the most frequent or biggest one that can cause us to become shipwrecked in our faith is, uh, is breakups and divorce. Now, breakups and divorce are an extremely painful thing. In fact, I would say that many of us in here know of someone as a result of having their heart ripped out through a breakup or a divorce, uh, we, we've known of someone or heard of someone who's literally killed themselves or committed suicide because the pain was just too much. And, and 
I think most of us in here know of someone who has tried at least to kill themselves because it was just so much for them when they experienced the pain of the loss of a breakup. And I think just about every one of us in here have experienced it ourselves that after you've had your heart ripped out through a breakup or, or a spouse leaving you in divorce, that you weren't going to kill yourself, but your prayers to God were something like, God, I, I, I just can't handle this pain. I mean, if you would just take me, it would be great. Over the 25 years of so of being a pastor, I've had a couple different people tell me that have experienced both a divorce and the death of a, of a spouse, they, they've told me that a divorce is actually harder. It's harder because, you know, when a spouse dies, like, I mean, they're just gone and, and you can't do anything about it, you can't talk to them, but in a divorce, like, every time you see that person, you're reminded of, of the failure. Every time you see that person, especially if you want them back, there's no chance of, chance of it, and so it, the, the, the hurt is just, it, it lasts a lot longer. The rejection is, is, is more than you can handle, and a lot of times in these situations, when we go through this hurt, when we feel like our heart's been ripped out, uh, a lot of times it can cause us to shipwreck in our faith because we're either angry with God, God, why did you allow this person to, to hurt me in this way? Or sometimes we feel so much guilt about it, especially in a divorce. We know when we hear that God hates divorce, right? And so as we go through that, we feel the sense of guilt and, and we just like, we avoid God, we avoid church and, and it causes us to ultimately shipwreck in our faith. And oftentimes, as a result, we, we do things that just make the situation all the worse. It, when you've had your heart ripped out, the tendency is to, to maybe move back to, to someone you dated before, or an ex, or, or find someone right away so you don't have to deal with that pain and that hurt. And, and, and going right on the rebound it, it doesn't help the situation at all. Others, you know, that pain is just so great, you'll turn to drugs or, or you'll turn to alcohol to numb yourself of the pain or, or, or you, you, you kind of like start going out partying and, and getting in toxic relationships just to try to distract you from, from the stuff that, that, that's going on and that, that makes you isolate all the more, you know, from God. It, we can become so self-destructive in times like that. It, it's, it's kind of like every... Every October, I'll go to the coast with some friends, and inevitably, as you're driving down the beach, as you can down there, you're going to get stuck in the sand. And when you get stuck in the sand, the last thing you need to do is just floor it, because you go from being stuck to being really stuck. This is what happens, you know, in relationships. When, when we have the, these breakups, when we have pain and the, uh, that come with breakups and divorce, we, we, by our actions, we can make a bad situation all the more bad. So how do we keep from becoming shipwrecked through breakups in divorce? Well, one of the things that we need to do is we need to sit down with someone who's a strong Christian in our lives. Someone who can encourage us to make healthy and positive decisions going forward. Uh, people that will ensure that we're leaning into God rather than pulling away from God. Uh, we need to, to, to look to God to fill that, that hole that is left in our lives. You see, when someone breaks up with us, when, when, when we've been hurt and divorced, there's gonna be a hole there, but, but that's like a God-shaped hole that we need to look to the God who, who loves us so much that, that, that his love is able to fill that hole rather than the things of, of this world. And ultimately, we gotta make sure we're not doing things to make the situation worse. Some of us in here have experienced being abandoned by a parent. Now that can happen in a couple of different ways. Uh, a lot of us grew up in, in divorced families and for some of us in, in those divorced families, maybe one of those parents weren't around. Some of us in here, like we, we literally had a parent maybe just up and one night like leave and never come back and never come back into our lives. You know, I, I, I've known people, know people who, who've never met their father or maybe have never met either of their parents. There, there's a lot of ways in which we can feel the hurt of being abandoned by 
a parent. And that will manifest itself in a couple of different ways. One, like because you've experienced that pain and hurt and you've been missing that, that, that discipline or that guidance from whichever parent that's missing is that in your youth years, you start making really destructive decisions and those destructive decisions carry over to your young adult years and, and beyond and it can shipwreck your life, can shipwreck your faith, especially for you know, young women who, who didn't have their dad around. They end up having daddy issues and, and they just want to feel loved by a man and they'll get themselves in all kinds of unhealthy and toxic situations just because they, they've missed out on this love and they're trying to find it from whatever place that they can. How do we become from being shipwrecked by being abandoned by a parent? Well, it's a lot like, you know, the divorce and breakups is that ultimately you got to understand that God has an amazing love for you. God, God loves you so much that, that he sent his son into this world. He, he watched his son suffer and die for you so that you might have eternal life through his son with him in heaven. God knows a very number of hairs on your head. As we grow closer to God, as we experience his love, whether it's a breakup or a divorce or whether it's being abandoned by a parent, when you have the fullness of God's love in, in your heart, then that will keep you from acting out and, and, and being destructive as, as you seek to try to fill that hole some other way. Some of us in here have experienced the pain of job loss. And, and, and job loss can be painful on many levels, Right? Because first of all, you experienced rejection. You thought you were important to your job. You thought this place would fall apart like if if you weren't there. And and you found out they don't really think the same. When when we have job loss, we have this illusion that we're in control of our lives. And when when that rug is ripped out from under under us, that illusion is, is gone. Not only is that illusion of being in control gone, but now you're like, how am I gonna provide for myself? How am I going to provide for my kids? How am I going to pay my mortgage? Am I going to be living? You know, all these things just hit you at once. Not to mention the biggest problem is most of us have our identities tied up with what we do for a living in our job. And when we lose our job, we lose our identities. And when we do, and when we struggle to find a new job, it's very easy to become shipwrecked as a person, to become shipwrecked in our faith. Why, God, would you allow this to happen? Well, some of the good that comes out of it is that, that you really learn your true identity. Your identity is not in what you do for a living. Your identity is in who you live for. And we live for our God in heaven. And, and in the end, a lot of us are in toxic jobs. We're in bad situations. It's not like a good work-family balance. Maybe it's not the most ethical company, but you know what? It pays the bills. And, and so we're not willing to leave the job, but that job loss causes us to, against our own will and desire, leave it. And then when we find the next one and on the kind of the backside of that whole situation, we can look back and see the hand and the blessing of God in it. Another area in which many of us run the risk of shipwrecking our faith is what I would call life's quarters. We've all heard of a midlife crisis, but we really have quarter life crises. At the end of the first quarter, you're somewhere in your mid 20s, maybe close to 30, and you're trying to figure out how to be an adult. You're trying to figure out you know, what your occupation is going to be. You're trying to figure out if you're going to get married, when you're going to get married, when you're going to have kids, how many kids you're going to have. And I would say the first life's quarter is all about busyness and trying to figure it out. And that's why in a lot of churches, you won't see a lot of people in their 20s that are there. Why? Because like life's just busy and you're, you're distracted and that busyness can cause your faith to be shipwrecked. As a kid, you went to church all the time. Your, your parents brought you. Maybe you were in the youth group at high school, but through college and now through those early 20 to late 20 years, you don't go at all. And then comes the midlife. And the midlife comes someone, somewhere in your 40s to maybe the early 50s. And and in the midlife is when you like decide, you know what, you are mortal and you're going to die and you don't like it. 
And you also look back and think, you know what? I thought by this point in my life, I'd have this, 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 that. And so now we start making poor decisions so that we can try to get what we never will get so that we don't have to face the fact that we're mortal and we're going to die. We're going to start living like we're in our 20s again because like that then will build this illusion that we're actually not getting older and going to die. And we start living very destructively and it can shipwreck the faith. And then I would say there's a three-quarter life crisis. The three-quarter life crisis is as you approach retirement or when you do retire. And I, I know so many people, when they reach that point, they just, the crisis is, why am I here? What's my purpose in life? What's even worth living? Because once again, so much of our purpose is tied to our occupation and what we do for a living, it can cause a real crisis in, in, in one's faith, in, in one's existence. And then there's that fourth quarter crisis that comes. That's when you know you're in the last weeks or maybe a few months of your life. And, and as you face that point, the crisis is, I wonder if all this stuff that I've claimed to believe my whole life is true because you're about to find out. I remember talking to a, a pastor friend that was sharing, I, I can't remember if it was like the retired pastor of the congregation he was serving or just a pastor that was there, but I think, it, I, I can't remember. But anyways, there's this pastor that was on his deathbed that was in his congregation. And it shocked me because he talked about how that pastor was literally terrified of dying because he didn't even know if like heaven was real. He didn't even know if he believed any of it. Can you imagine being a pastor your whole life, ministering to countless numbers of people in their final moments and in, in their final breaths and, and, and having done that your whole life and never really knowing if you believe and doubt in it and now having to be faced with that as you breathe your last. There, there's multiple different ways in life and situations and seasons in life in which we can fall into crisis that, that can really shipwreck our faith. And when we focus on those seasons and when we focus on those circumstances, then what you're doing is you're building a foundation on sinking sand and it's not gonna work out well. It doesn't matter what season you're in. It doesn't matter if you're in the quarter. It doesn't matter if you're in the half. It doesn't matter if you're in the three quarters or the fourth quarter. If you're focused on Christ and you're looking at Jesus, then, then you, now you're building a foundation on, on solid ground that whatever the circumstances are going around doesn't matter because you're focused on Jesus and not those circumstances. Another big one for shipwrecking our faith is when we hit financial difficulties in life. You know, for good reason, the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. And when we hit financial hard times, what happens is we start, we start doing things that we otherwise wouldn't do because we're so uh, threatened by not having enough to cover our means. And so when, when we're in those financial, financially challenged times, we're gonna take a job that's gonna pay the most rather than what's the best fit because all we care about is getting ourselves out of debt. All we care about is getting ourselves out of that hole that we've dug ourselves in. So now we take the, the best paying job when it could be the absolute worst job for you. It could be the one that's only gonna last three months because they're gonna end up firing you anyways. But that's the one that we're gonna be drawn to and take even though we know it's not the best one for us. But when we're in financial difficult times, that's the one that we take. When we're in financially difficult times, if we're a salesperson, we're probably going to be a little more pushy in, in our sales. We might be a little less forthcoming in what the real situation is. Why? So, th so that we can close that deal and we can make more money, even if it like borderlines on taking advantage of others. When we're in those financially difficult times, we may lie on our taxes because to get an extra $1,500 back would be enough to maybe you know, get us through the, you know, the, the, the next house payment or, or the couple car payments that we've fallen behind. When we're in financial problems, maybe we make risky investments or we take the little that we have to the casino to try to make it work because we just don't think we have enough otherwise. Did you know that money is the number one cause for divorce? Did you know that money is significant in the people that kill themselves? A lot of people kill themselves over money. And finances have caused a lot of shipwrecks in faith. 
How do we avoid those shipwrecks? Well, we have to learn the gift of being content. Look at Philippians chapter 4, 11 to 13. Paul says, I've learned to be content with whatever the circumstances. I, I know what it's like to be in need, and I know what it's like to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether it's well-fed or hungry, whether it's living in plenty or in want. For I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Amen. Until we learn to, uh, the, the art and the gift of being content, financial difficulties run the risk of causing us to shipwreck our faith. And if on one end, financial difficulties can cause us to shipwreck our faith, what we'll find is on the other end, wealth can cause that as well. Because when we begin to chase wealth, then all we care about is that which elevates us, that improves our situation, that we begin to live for our own improvement rather than for maybe God and what his will for our life is. That, that's what Zacchaeus was guilty of. Remember, it says of Zacchaeus, he was an extremely wealthy man. Why? Because he's doing an occupation that will allow him to get rich. He He's ripping people off so that he can get rich. And all of that's okay if like your goal is to chase wealth. Because wealth just looks into what's your, in the best interest of you rather than others. How many people have gotten wealthy stepping over the back of other people, especially climbing the corporate ladder? One person gets the, 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 the raise and the, and, the, and the promotion and the other person does not. Mark Cuban, I heard just yesterday on the radio or the day before, he's offering to build, on his own dime, the, a new stadium for the Mavs to play in. Now, now, that's very generous, except there's a caveat. He's willing to do that if they're willing to, uh, the state legislature is willing to approve resort-style gambling at that location. Oh, and from his perspective, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, people want to gamble and it's chasing wealth. And he's going to become richer, but you become richer because other people are losing their money. And I wonder how many people, if that's approved, will go to that place thinking, you know what, I just need an extra $1,500. If I can, everything's going to be okay and they'll lose the last 1500 that they have. How many people who are addicted to gambling will, will, will like just make very poor decisions there? How many people will just squander their fortunes as they chase even more? But that doesn't really matter if you're just chasing wealth. And, and that's the problem with chasing wealth. I mean, like, you take even the stock market. I mean, uh, some people make money because other people lose. It doesn't work that everyone makes money. There's got to be losers so that there can be winners. But when we're focused on wealth, that doesn't matter. 1 Timothy 6.10 says this, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and they've pierced themselves with many griefs. And Matthew 19, 23 to 24 says this, then Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it's hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. In fact, he says, again, I tell you, it's actually easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. What are you doing to make sure that wealth isn't shipwrecking you in your faith? Because it's very subtle, and sometimes we don't even realize it's happening. Pregnancy is something that can shipwreck us in our faith as well. You know, for some people, they... They find out after they get married and decide they're ready to start a family, they find out, you know what? They, they, they can't get pregnant. And it's at that moment when you have dreams of, of having a family of two kids, three kids, four kids, and now you're told, told that it's, it's just not going to happen. You're not, you can't have any, that people will wrestle with that, become angry with God. Like, God, why would you, why would you make it so that I can't even have children and, and, and can become shipwrecked in their faith? The funny thing is, is over the 25 years of being a pastor, I've known multiple families that were told that. They adopt two or three, and about 12 years later or whatever, they start having kids of their own, Right? but also pregnancy related. What about miscarriages and, and, and when that happens and, and you get all excited about you know, having a baby and, and, and that baby dies 
before the baby's even born, that, that can rip your heart out, that can rip at your soul and, and cause you to become shipwrecked in your faith. And then there's that topic of unwanted pregnancies. And what's interesting is how unwanted pregnancies can shipwreck our faith because it kind of goes something like this. You're against abortion, but you find out your 16-year-old daughter is sexually active and she's pregnant. And you don't want people at church to know. You don't want the neighbors to know. You don't want your friends to know. You don't want her to have to drop out of school. You don't want her to have to give up on college and her dreams and all this stuff. And suddenly, guess what? Abortion's not all that wrong. Or you're, you're career-minded and you're, you're against abortion, but, but you, you, weren't, you thought you were protecting yourself from getting pregnant and you haven't like, accomplished what you want to yet in life and, and now you're pregnant and, and, and it's not the right time. It's going to get in the way of, of you accomplishing what you want. So all of a sudden you're for it. Or you think you're done with kids. You haven't had a, you know, your last child's 12 years old. You're now in your late forties and you find out like a whoops happened and, 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 and you're pregnant and you don't really want to be a parent, you know, raising a kid at home till you're 70. And all of a sudden you're for it. Or you go outside of your marriage and you get someone pregnant and, and you don't want anyone to find out about that. So you tell the person, you know, you're going to have to have an abortion. It's interesting how an unwanted pregnancy can shipwreck faith. I have to tell you, I, I've seen this myself as a pastor. I've seen someone who's a new Christian, probably just a year long in their faith, get themselves into a situation that wasn't ideal. They chose to end the pregnancy and it shipwrecked that faith that was just a year old. Another thing that can shipwreck our faith is our failures. You know, sometimes our failures cause us to lean into God, but oftentimes our failures cause us to turn away from God. Why? Because either our failures are our fault or they're not our fault. If our failures are not our fault, we're mad at God that we just had a failure and we could do nothing about it. Like, like why'd you allow this to happen? But usually our failures are our faults. You know, our marriage fails, our career fails, as a parent we failed, and we feel the guilt of being a failure, and as a result of being a failure, we, we just, we turn away from God. We turn away from a church because we just feel like a failure, and, and, and it shipwrecks our faith. And the funny thing is about, like, when, when you feel like, no one wants to feel like a failure, so when you do feel like a failure, you're going to do things that will try to numb you so you don't have to feel like a failure, and, and it makes things all the worse. That that's when we turn to alcohol. Why? So that you can numb yourself from feeling like a failure. That's why we turn to drugs, so that you can feel a little bit better even in the midst of your failures. It's, it's why we might hop in a relationship with another person or, 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 or like live a life of partying and, and all these other things to take our minds off the fact that we're a failure. But rather than running away from God in our failures, we ought to run to God in our failures because the truth is, is we're all failures. And we're all going to, in some way, mess up and make mistakes. None of us can be perfect. Scripture says that if you say you have no sin, you're actually lying to yourself. And God's truth is not in you. So we're going to fail and we're going to make mistakes. And that's okay. Sometimes we just have to embrace those mistakes because there's one who paid that price so that even in our failings and even in our mistakes, we can be made whole and we can be made right. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might be the righteousness of God. Jesus had no sin, but he becomes sin for us so that we are the righteousness of God. That even in the midst of our failures and our mistakes, it's okay because we're actually righteous and we're whole. We don't have to run from God and we don't have to hide from God because Jesus has paid the price. And then just two more. Living in dysfunction can often cause us to be shipwrecked in our faith. Some of us grew up in extremely dysfunctional homes and it's all that we knew and, and it was so messed up, but it seemed normal. But, and the problem is, is because that's how we were raised, that's how, how we did it. 
Some of us in here weren't raised dysfunctionally, but whoever we married was pretty messed up and they lived a very dysfunctional life. And so as we marry them, we inherit their dysfunction. Some of us in here, like we just kind of become dysfunctional as we go through life. But here's the problem of living a dysfunction, why it threatens to shipwreck our faith because dysfunction turns everything upside down. It makes something normal that shouldn't be. It makes something that's that's wrong right. And what's right becomes wrong. What's good becomes bad. What bad becomes good. We live in such a dysfunctional world nowadays where everything has been turned upside down. Everything is inside out. We don't even know what functionality is anymore. And so how do we keep from becoming shipwrecked and dysfunction? You got to turn to God's word because in God's word, it it illuminates what functionality is. And you're going to see it looks a whole lot different than how the world is today. And then lastly, kind of where we began this when I talked about Matthew Perry is that addictions can cause us to become shipwrecked in our lives and in our faith. You know, some people have just addictive personalities and they're easily addicted to things. And the things that we can be addicted to is is more than you can count. We can become addicted to people We can become addicted to possessions and belongings. We can become addicted to drugs and alcohol. We can become addicted to gambling. We can become addicted to pornography. Just about anything we can become addicted to. But here's the problem with addictions. Addictions consume us and addictions control us. We begin to organize and arrange our lives around those addictions. And the problem is, is we, 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 we believe in a God who says, don't put anything before me. And it doesn't matter what your addiction is. If that addiction controls your life, it gets in the way of your relationship with God and threatens to shipwreck you. You know, as I'm going through this, what's the answer to all of these? The answer is the same thing as what it was to Zacchaeus. Jesus is the answer. He has the ability to unshipwreck us. I mentioned how every fall, every October, I go to the coast. I remember this one year, it was just me and my one buddy, and we decided we were going to stay on an island that year. Mix it up a little bit. And we had never been out to that island before. In fact, he, I don't think he had ever brought his boat down to the bay before. And, uh, and so we got down there late one afternoon. It was already pretty late in the day, uh, probably like around 4.35 in uh, late October. So there's probably only like an hour and a half or maybe two hours best of, uh, of sunlight available. And so we loaded everything in the boat to go out to the island to camp for uh, a few days and we started to head out there. And as we're uh, zipping across the water, uh, you know, at a pretty good speed, uh, it, it must have went from like five, six feet down to six inches. And before we know it, we were just like going 35 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour into, into like just a sandbar, basically some super shallow water. And the boat just like stops and, you know, we all, he and I were lurch, lurching forward and all of our stuff on the boat and so forth. And we're just stuck. And so I get out of the boat and I'm like, you know, I, you know, I'm going to push it. And he, he's like, there, there's thousands of pounds between the weight of the boat and everything that's in the boat. Pushing isn't going to help. You know, we we're probably 30 yards onto this thing. And I'm like, well, what else are we going to do? And, you know, it, it just, it wasn't a good situation because by the time that happened, I mean, the sun was starting to get fairly low in the sky, maybe about 45 minutes of sunlight left. There's not a lot of people out. There's no one actually out on the water that we're seeing. And I'm like, you know what? we're going to be spending the night in this boat in a place that we don't really know and it just wasn't going to be a good situation. And as we're coming to terms with that, then suddenly like a boat comes by and it was a boat that the guy must have realized that we weren't just sitting there fishing, we were stuck. He knew the water well enough and he actually cared enough to do something about it and he pulled up and asked if we needed help and we're like, yeah, we need help. And so I took some rope from his boat and I walked it out to this guy's boat and he had some of rope from his boat, we tied it together and he was still able to be in deep enough water that he was able to, to gun his boat and, and, and pull us off and, and unstuck us from being shipwrecked. Now, what would have been extremely stupid is like to say, thanks, cut the rope, turn the boat around and gun it in the same direction. And I'm proud to say we didn't do that. But oftentimes that's what we do in life. You see, that's what Jesus has done. It's what he did to Zacchaeus. He comes to Zacchaeus, he says, come down. And Zacchaeus doesn't come down and just gun it in the same direction. Zacchaeus says, listen, half of all that I have, I'm given to the poor. And and if I've ripped anyone off, I'm going to give them four times 
what's owed them. Jesus will get us off those sandbars. Even when we become shipwrecked, he will restore us, but we got to be, be careful that we don't just do the same thing over and get ourselves shipwrecked all over again. I know I covered a lot of different topics this morning, but are you currently shipwrecked in your life? Are you in danger? Are you, are you, are you close to becoming shipwrecked? Go to God in prayer and talk to him. Be, because he's willing to hear our prayers and, 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 and you know, to be able to process through with the almighty, the, the almighty God of creation is willing to listen to us. Go to him in prayer. Ask him for wisdom. Like sometimes we just don't know. Sometimes we're just so confused by the messiness of life. Like, is this good? Is this bad? What? Talk to God. Ask him for wisdom. Give me direction on how to handle this situation. Give me direction on how I can become unshipwrecked because sometimes we, we don't know the answer ourselves. Ask him for strength because I'm here to tell you, like, if you're shipwrecked, it's not a real comfortable situation. And part of what we need is the strength to endure until our boat becomes afloat again. And then lastly, we need to look to his word. Because we're told that by his word, we will know truth. And it's through his truth that, that we're set free. It's by his word and that truth that, that that shipwreck is, is buoyed again and that ship is, our ships are able to move forward again. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious Almighty God, I just thank and praise you for this morning to be able to, to talk about these, these difficult topics. Life is so incredibly messy. Sometimes we bring the things upon ourselves, but sometimes, gracious God, they, they come by no invitation to, by us at all. And I just pray for everyone in here this morning that you give us wisdom. And where we've become shipwrecked, where we're in danger of becoming shipwrecked, that, that we look to you to, to be the one who frees us from those things that just seek to overwhelm us. Whatever quarter we're at in our lives, the first quarter, the second quarter, the third, or maybe approaching the fourth, gracious God, help us to keep our eyes focused on you and help us to, to look to you to be able to restore what oftentimes can be very broken and hurt lives and relationships. We pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.